was raining again. My poor corns. Do you mind, Carol, dear? If I get into your bed, I'm so lonely and chilly in my room. Oh, no, dear. Get right in. How are you feeling this morning, Aunt Lou? Not very well. My poor head. <laughs> yes, my head. Sure it isn't your liver, darling? It was your liver yesterday. Was it? Maybe tomorrow all your teeth will fall out and you may break an egg. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, your breakfast is ready, Carol. Thanks, dear. You've no idea how that woman needles me when you are out of sight. Oh, you just imagine that, Aunt Lou. Take the grand friend. I wish she was in Timbuktu. Oh, no, you don't. If it weren't for Kate, we couldn't afford this nice little flat. It's all very well for you. You're at a nice, comfortable office all day long. But I have to stay at home listening to her giving music lessons. Da 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 I suppose Aunt Lou will be hanging around your neck even after you marry Ronnie. I can't throw her in the dustbin. Why not? Don't let her mess up your married life. You don't know how lucky you are to get a husband. I know, Kate. And I do appreciate Ronnie. Oh, heavens. I'll be late. Oh, here. Take this with you. <laughs> Mutton? I'll bleed if you do. Can't you think of something else? Liver. I'd feel as if I were carving into Aunt Lou. Well, how would you like some lobster, caviar, capon, and champagne? Get out. I know. Let's have something different. What? Mutton. Carol! She's gone. She's escaped. Miss Hard? I'm sorry, Mr. Trouble. Why are you late, Miss Hard? I was looking at a hat. A hat? Yes, a hat. Well, well. On the foundation's time, you were looking at a hat. I'm sorry, Mr. Trouble. Uh, that will be all for the present. Thank you. 
Return. Happy to see him? Of course. Do you realize it's been three years? I wonder if he's changed. Not Ronnie. Nothing could ever change him. He's just good old substantial. <laughs> Won't he be happy when he hears the news? <laughs> see you later. Ronnie, don't... Oh, oh I'm sorry. I thought... Uh, this flat's to let, isn't it? The what? Oh, oh, yes. Yes. Well, uh, may I see it? The agent didn't tell me anyone was coming. Oh, I'm sorry. It's entirely my fault. I was to have let him know. If it's inconvenient, I... Oh, no, not at all. It's quite all right. Do, do, do come in. Thank you. Uh... This, uh, this is the hall. Uh, it's rather obvious from Mark, isn't it? But there you are. There's the hall. Uh, will you, uh... Thank you. And this is the sitting room. Hmm. Very attractive. I see you like uh, nice things. Oh, what a lovely Chippendale. Did you uh, inherit it? In a way, yes. I picked it up one day at an auction. <laughs> <laughs> you won't find the view very amusing. Oh, yes. 
Yes, it's just what I'm looking for. Is it really? You see, this is one of the things I've remembered through all the years I've been away from here. I've looked upon all the beauties of the world. The stars mirrored in the Gulf of Corinth, the cherry blossoms in Japan, the Taj Mahal. Like an eerie dream, still and cool in the moonlight. And I've longed for this. Perhaps because, when I was a boy, my window looked out upon the rooftops of London. And that was before ambition was realized. Before wars, travel, wealth. That's why I felt the need of coming back to it, of trying to recapture. Not youth. That's impossible. But the dreams of youth. Would you care to look at the kitchen? Is it a nice one? Quite. <laughs> then I'll take your word for it. Uh, I'm a bachelor and I know a lot more about campfires in the forest than I do about kitchens. <laughs> we have two bedrooms. I'll show them to you if, if you don't mind waiting just a moment. Thank you. Hello, Ronnie. It isn't Ronnie. It's a man come to look at the flat. Oh, oh thank goodness you cleared up this room. But don't you have mint like it out? I'm just going to pick up the tickets. When money comes, tell them to save a hug for me. Right. All set for inspection. It's very cheerful. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit fussy for a man's room. Oh, uh, I shall have to store one of these beds. You mind? Oh, not at all. There's a small bedroom just off the hall. You could store anything you didn't want in there. Yes, I have my trunks and photographic supplies. Oh, you're a photographer. Oh, an amateur one. It's uh, my hobby. I'm really a, a chemical engineer. I haven't the slightest idea what that means. Mm -hmm. It sounds dreadfully scientific. Yes, I'm afraid it is. <laughs> oh. oh, will you excuse me? There's, there's someone at the door. Let's have a look at you. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, this is my fiancé, Mr. Bruce. Mr. A Lovell, Gerald Lovell. Mr. Lovell was looking at the flat. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Uh, please don't bother about it now. I do like your flat, though. I'll drop back again a little bit later, if you don't mind. Oh, not a bit. Please do. Thank you. Goodbye. I've got some great news for you. Well, I have a little news for you myself. All right. I'll let you tell me yours first. Well, I have an awful confession to make. You know how you've always scolded me about my vice. <laughs> Silly. You never had a vice in the world. The only thing you ever did was to gamble all your money on crazy lotteries. Well, that's it. My vice. And it turned into a virtue. I won a French national lottery, the grand prize. Is this really true? Every word of it. Well, what's the matter, Ronnie? Aren't you pleased about it? Oh, yes, sir. Of course I'm pleased, but... But what? Well, it rather takes the wind out of my sails. But why, Ronnie? Well, to come back and find the girl one's going to marry with... with an overwhelming fortune. Well, you can't think it will make any difference with me. Carol, can't you see? I've been working for five years in the Sudan with one end in view, one ambition. That when I got back, I'd be able to make things a little better for you. Now this has happened. And everything's so out of proportion to anything that I could do for you that... Oh, Ronnie. Let's forget all about this silly money business and... and just pretend that you aren't going to marry a rich woman. I couldn't bear to lose you. Hmm. Who's going to lose me? You aren't suggesting that we break our engagement by any chance. 
I don't say foolish things like that, even in fun. You see, I'm a kind of stodgy person, and, well, I'm not easily uprooted. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll uproot you. Oh, wait till you hear the plan. For our marriage? Of course, darling, but that, that comes later. Let's not be married here. Let's be married in some lovely romantic place like, like Venice. First of all, we go to Paris to collect the prize money. And I'm taking Kate along, you don't mind, do you? Kate, Kate's one of us. And then I thought we'd drift all over the continent, all over the world if we want to. You're not including me in this, are you? Of course. Well, I have to be at the office on Monday to take over my new job. Let them wait. Let who wait? Oh, the, the heads of the cotton company, wherever they are. Now, Carol, be sensible. I'm not going to chuck up a job that's taken me practically all my life to get. Why not? I'm sorry, Ronnie. I didn't mean to put it like that. But I only wanted you to realize that you don't have to keep your nose to the grindstone any longer. What I have is yours, naturally. No, it isn't, Carol. I'm glad you've got it, but... But what? Well, I just can't get used to the idea of you taking me on our honeymoon. Do you have to go to Paris? Well, naturally. Couldn't Kate go for you? No, I have to be there myself on Monday. When do you come back? I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? I'd like to see a little something of it after I'm there. Surely you can't expect me to have a chance like this for the first time in my life and not take advantage of it. No, I suppose not. And Italy. I've always dreamed of seeing Italy. The Gulf of Corinth. The cherry blossoms in Japan. The colors in the house. In the moonlight. Cool, still, like an eerie dream. <laughs> and it's all very well for you to laugh. You've seen things. You've traveled. Yes, I've been to the filthy Sudan. We call that traveling. No eerie dreams there, Carol. Well, I was perfectly willing to go there with you when we were first engaged. Thank heavens I had sense enough not to take you. You'd have loathed it. I wouldn't loathe anything out of the ordinary. I'm fed up with routine and drabness. Daily life, all cut out of the same pattern. I want something exciting, something... Oh, something new and interesting and romantic. The trouble with you is this money's gone to your head. Oh, stop it, Ronnie. Just because your stubborn mind can't move out of the narrow little cell in which it lives. So you can't see anyone else's point of view. You're unfair. You spoiled everything, but I'm glad I found out about it in time. Well, I'm glad, too, if that's the way you feel. I call him back? Oh, no, no, it, uh, it wasn't anything important. Just left in rather a hurry, and I... Won't you come in? Thank you. Ronnie! Oh! I'm so glad to see you. Hello, Kate. Have you seen Carol? Yes, I've seen her. Well, what's the matter? Oh, all this rotten money business. It's ruined everything. Go on. You two have scrapped ever since you were kids. Go back there. Take her in your arms. Tell her your story. No. I see. Big he-man stuff. Want to make the little girl crawl on her hands and knees to you. All right, Ronnie. But it's your funeral. If you're only going to be away about six weeks, it seems hardly worth my while taking the flat. But uh, I'll think it over and telephone you. The number is Bayswater 6093. Thank you. The name is Miss Howard. Miss Carol Howard. Do you mind if I, uh, if I make a note of it? Not at all. Oh, not, not that I'll forget it, but <laughs> I, uh... I make a complete record of everything I do in this little book. Oh. Well, what are you putting down now? Dinner tonight with Miss Carol Howard. Oh, really? 
I'm sorry, but I'm... I'm leaving for Paris first thing in the morning. Tonight, I'll... Of course. You'll be dining with your fiancé. Thank you, Miss Howard, for showing me the flat. came to look at our flat yesterday. Did you ask him to go to Paris with you? <laughs> well, why is he following you? Don't be absurd. Does he know you won the lottery? No, and if he did, it wouldn't mean anything. He's a very rich man. Well, then why was he looking at our little two before flat? He liked the view. Probably won't even speak to us. I'll give him ten minutes by the clock. Now that you've met Mr. Lovell, what do you think of him? I don't think. He's rather good looking, isn't he? Mm, so is a halibut. Oh. Well, why did I bring that up? Well, you must admit he has beautiful manners. Never trust a man with beautiful manners. He's just annoy me. But would you like him better if he walked right up and sucked you in the nose? If he did, I might go betty about him. Did you Miss Meadows? Never felt better in my life. Good. I've brought you some hot chocolate and whipped cream, some toasted sardines, and a little French pastry. Excuse me. <laughs> Alone at last. Oh, that was a filthy trick. Poor Kate. Nice to see you again. Rather a surprise. Not to me. Really? Did you find your flat with a view? Oh, yes, I found the flat. But the view took a boat to Paris. <laughs> What about all that serious work you were going to do? Well, as I've already confessed, I can't work without inspiration. So that's why you're going to Paris? Yes. Inspiring city, isn't it? You know, I've never been there. Never? No. Oh, I'd like to show you Paris. The Paris that I know, not the shoddy Paris that all the tourists see. Oh, thanks. That's awfully kind of you, but you know, Kate has a marvelous guidebook. Guidebook? But I'm talking about strange, out-of-the-way places and wild, exciting nights. Ending up with onion soup in the market. <laughs> Kate and I will certainly have to do just that. Pardon me, madam. But a lady hanging over the rail down there says she's going to die, or has died. She's not sure which. And would you mind coming down for a moment? <laughs> coming back? Well, I'll, um, I'll have to be back for my coat. <laughs> Oh, 
Hello. Hello. Ronnie. Well, what in the world are you doing in Paris? Oh, I can't see you, Ronnie, because I... Well, well, maybe you'd better come up, and, uh, and then I can explain. Right. Hello, Ronnie. Hello, Carol. I'm sorry to dash in you like this, but uh, I really have to see you. Come in. Thank you. A bit different from the old flat in Bayswater, isn't it? Well, it is a bit. Are you enjoying this new life? To the full. I've been miserable without you. Oh, Ronnie. I don't know how I'm going to say this to you. I think I know what you're trying to tell me. You think you're in love with this chap. Is that it? Believe me, Carol, you're living in a fool's paradise. You don't belong to this world of tinsel. Why, look at this suite. It's simply, simply fantastic in its luxury. Maybe all right for a few days, but you're not the type to live this way. Letting a fella like love will make you think that this and all that goes with it is reality. Oh, poor darling. You can't let yourself get carried away by someone you don't know. Especially this kind of a scoundrel. How dare you say that? You don't know anything about him. Neither do you, Carol. Don't be such a trusting little girl all your life. Unbelievable. Do you see something symbolic about this? Aquarium. Look at those golden beauties, gliding with vain contentment through the crystal waters, completely oblivious of the fact that to the world they're nothing but poor fish. Ronnie, I think you oh, better... Oh, darling, come back to England with me before you're disillusioned and unhappy. This fellow's nothing more than a, than a fortune hunter. Well, I'll stop it. I won't hear another word against him. But you must, Carol. I've checked up on him. All these yarns he told you and Kate about his South American oil company. But they're true. They're not true. There is such a company, but they never heard of Lovell. They never even heard of him at the school he was supposed to have gone to, or at any hotel that he was supposed to have stayed at. Frankly, I got so worried that I, I turned the entire case over to Scotland Yard. You what? They'll soon get a line on him. Oh, Carol, come back with me. Don't get carried away by this foolish romantic whim. Will you please leave? But Carol, I... Just... Hello, Bruce. Surprised to see you here. Darling, to be quite frank, Ronnie came here to rescue me from you. He had so much to say on the subject, he really didn't give me a chance to tell him that we were married this morning. I'm sorry, Ronnie. I wanted to tell you quite differently. I know how you must feel. I couldn't have taken it as well as you have. You see, I... I happen to love Carol myself. So I can sympathize. Darling, I'm so sorry that had to happen. I'm glad he came. I want you to be sure. Very sure. It was my fault, rushing into a marriage like this. But I love you, and that's my only excuse. Carol. Carol, you should take time to think it over. And then...
even if you want the marriage dissolved. I'd understand because I do love you. And I always shall. Maybe she's got troubles of her own. What do you mean? <laughs> Stop, Kate. You're not letting Ronnie turn you against Gerald, are you? I don't know. I've been doing a lot of thinking lately. Perhaps I made a mistake leaving Carol alone with him. If I'd have stayed there, she might not have married him. Then you are worried. I suppose I am. I'll know more about it when I see Carol. And if I find she's not happy... Ah. I'm afraid you'll find Carol ridiculously happy. Hello, Kate. Hello, Gerald. Nice to see you again. I suppose this is my Auntie Lou? How <laughs> She can't answer. Mm -hmm. She's got to get rid of the Adams apple. It was Kate who said those awful things about you, not me. I didn't open my mouth. <laughs> I don't blame Kate. She's a good friend and she's Carol's interest at heart. Won't you, uh, won't you sit down? Nothing. <laughs> Aunt Lou and Kate. Oh, Carol. My, you are looking fit. She has a pain in her side. Which side, dear? It will. Uh, it floats. Carol, darling, Kate's got a pain, too. Really? In her heart. She's been worrying about you ever since our marriage. Oh. Oh, Kate, I've had too much of heaven. Oh, I'm glad. I just wanted to check up on Joe. I wanted to see if he was doing right by our nails. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's for you, darling. Tell me about the house, I think. While well, I'm sitting in the next room. Right. Uh, will you put this call on the other telephone, please? Thank you. Sit down, darling. We'll have tea up here. Let me look at you, Carol. Have I changed? No. But Gerald has. I don't think he's looking so well. He isn't, Kate. I'm worried about him. He had a heart attack in Venice. It was really quite frightening for a moment. You see, he was rather badly hurt in the war. Sometimes he gets the most dreadful pressure in his head. Yes, yes. All right. I'll take care of it. So, that's why we're buying a house in the country. Gerald must have quiet and seclusion. Besides, he has a lot of important work to do. Where are you buying the house? In Kent. Oh, Gerald says it's a duck of a place. About ten acres, no prying neighbors. It's an old house. Haven't you seen it? No. He wants to keep it a surprise. Sounds a delightful place to spend a weekend. How's Ronnie? Still pretty broken up. Poor darling. Of course, you can see now, Kate. I was nothing but jealous. I suppose so. Hmm? Oh, come in. Don't order much for me, dear. My doctor has put me on a strict diet. Can you have tea? Mm hmm. Sorted sandwiches? Mm hmm. Those little hot muffins? Oh, yes. How about some pastries? That sounds very nice, dear. And you order whatever else you like. I'm going to go take off my bonnet. <laughs> Wait up. Have you got those little meringue things? Mm. It's the chocolate and the cream and the cherries on the top. Gerald. Gerald, darling, what's the matter? Are you ill? No, dear, it's nothing. Don't be alarmed. Well, has, has something gone wrong? No, no, really, nothing at all. 
Kate didn't say something that hurt you. Oh, I... I suppose I shouldn't blame her. Oh, oh. It's only that she's so fond of me. And now that she sees how happy I am... Of course, dear, I understand. <sighs> Darling, what is troubling you? Couldn't you get the house? Oh, yes, we can get it, but... Oh, but what, dear? That was my solicitor on the telephone. Oh, I thought he said it was the agent for the house. No, no, dear, you misunderstood. It was my solicitor. Bad news? Yes, rather. They're holding up my South American bank draft. It may not be straightened out for days. Oh, is that all? Well, that's enough, isn't it? Oh, darling, I was afraid it was something perfectly dreadful. If that's all it is, well, I can do something about that. No. No. Now, you mustn't have such a silly false pride. You can't mind if I help. Now, Carol, you're a sweet person. Now, never let's discuss this again. What's yours is yours. And what's mine is also yours. Is that quite clear? If I'm forced to borrow 5,000 pounds for the house, understand it's a business agreement, and I'll pay you interest. I demand my interest in advance. Please, may I collect right now? <laughs> Now for the first part of this foolish agreement. I'll have your signature to a paper. Certainly. What is it? Oh, something in connection with the purchase of the place. It's full of to which, to whom's, whereas it's whomsoever's, and a few parties of the first part. Oh, where do I sign? There they are. Aren't you going to read it? Have you read it? Of course I never sign anything I don't read. Is it all right? Of course. Then why should I bother to read it? One more, dear. Have you with it? Delighted. You are, darling. short way. You two excited. You're all of a tremble where you might go and mutter or stutter. Fall over yourself or something. You'll take this trash into the kitchen. Miriam, what are you doing with them flowers? Here we are. Home. Oh, Gerald, it is lovely. It's all peaceful, isn't it? Not a neighbor for miles. No cars, no telephones. In other words, the simple life. Will you bring the luggage in this way, please? Luggage. Oh, Gerald. You must have had something. Oh, oh, this is Emmy Hobson's niece. I thought I'd keep her on, too. How do you do, Emmy? I do very nicely, ma'am, except on ironing. I ain't so awful good at ironing. Emmy's a good girl, ma'am, but she ain't so bright. Oh, oh. put these down here, sir. Yes, please. No. Uh, sir. Thank you very much. Take sir. the things upstairs, will you, Hobson? I'll show you where to put them. Yes, I'm beginning to feel at home already. <laughs> you happy? I'll be back in a moment. Are you married, ma'am? Why, certainly, Annie. Well, I didn't know. You act so daffy about him. But we're still on our honeymoon. Perhaps that explains it. Oh. I never expect to get me a man. Mr. Uncle George Hobson says I ain't quite bright. But I'm willing. Hmm. Well, Emmy, will you see if you can get us a cup of tea, please? Oh, yes, <laughs> ma'am. Oh, sir. I'm sorry, I quite forgot to tell you a parcel arrived for you this morning. No? Well, where did you put it? Why, in the cellar, sir. I told you to keep out of there. No one is to go into that cellar but me. No one. Why? 
Oh, oh, Carol, I, I was just explaining to Hobson. The cellar is my own private property. My dark room for photographs and experiments. So I shall have chemicals and things that are dangerous. Oh, please don't go blowing us up with a lot of old chemicals. I'm much too happy to want to die just yet. Don't worry. I'll be very careful. Hobson, you haven't shown uh, Mrs. Lovell your garden. Thank you, sir. Yes. I'm afraid there isn't very much to show you, madam. But what there is of the flowering shop that are left now... It's a lovely garden, Hobson. Oh, I don't know. Won't she uh, seem run down a bit? I like it. I you could play the piano. You've been keeping secrets from me. Don't stop. I want to hear it. I like that thing you were playing. I, I like it because it's fast. Oh, heavens, I can't play. Go on, try, try. Oh, I don't even know if I remember it. I'll have to get you a mechanical piano or a gramophone. I have a portable gramophone downstairs. I play it a great deal while I'm working. It excites my mind, quickens my thoughts, makes my head spin, reminding me of the war or a, of a dawn. Standing in cold terror in a trench, 
an enemy barrage creeping up. Shells shrieking, exploding in staccato rhythm. Coming closer, closer. And suddenly the noise changes into music. Turning my first terror into ecstasy. Yes, officer. I thought you might like some of these, ma'am. They smell the house up nice like. Oh, thank you, Hobson. They are sweet. Oh, Hobson, I, uh, I found your pick and shovel. Did he, sir? Where were they? In the cellar. <laughs> and you're a boy been blaming them gypsies. Are the gypsies about? Oh, worse than fleas. They come down to the village every year for the fair. Fair? Yes. When is the fair? This year, on September the 5th. September the 5th? Yes. Oh, thank you, Hobson. Good afternoon, Mom and Sir. Thank you. What now? September the 5th. Oh, I think the fair. Nine o'clock. Why nine o'clock? That's the hour. The hour we go to the fair? Mm-hmm. When we go to the fair. <laughs> oh. Gerald. You paid 5,000 pounds for the house, didn't you? Yes, why do you ask? Well, Hobson was telling me that the man who owned the house was asking only half that money. Are you going to believe that doddering old fool or me? Well, I, there's no question of believing you. I, I just thought possibly you might have been cheated. No, you weren't implying because you had to advance me the money on a loan, understand, that I... Oh. But, Cheryl... How can you say a thing like that? I'm sorry, it was, it was misunderstanding. But I'm naturally sensitive about borrowing money, especially... Take out that little book. Why? I want you to write something in it. Now put down, today we had our first and last quarrel. I adore my wife. Do you? And I've got a present for her. A present? Mm hmm What is it? Gerald. Oh, how lovely. Oh, it's nothing very much. It's got a sentimental value attached to it. Wait a minute. I'll, I'll show you how it's worn. I bought it in a bazaar in Cairo. I'll take you there someday. Moonlight in the desert. Weird music. Mysterious. <gasps> Emmy! Excuse me, ma'am. You nearly choked me. Sorry. What happened? Oh, look so pretty. Got me all fuddled inside. <laughs> That's all right, Emmy. <laughs> Don't let anyone disturb our happiness. Not that noisy Kate, nor Auntie Lou, nor anyone. I'll do my very best to keep them all away.
darling. Darling, forgive me. It startled me so I... I didn't know what I was doing. Let go of me, darling. Let go. Please, dearest. Please let me explain. I was so absorbed in my work. I... It's my nerves. They're almost at the breaking point. I didn't realize at first that it was you. Standing there in the doorway. Like a ghost. Yes, a ghost. I'll never forget the way you look. Like a mad thing. Oh, Carol. Carol, beloved. Don't go away from me. Don't you see that I'm ill? Seriously ill. I, I don't know what it is. Something is inside my head. Burns and tortures me. That reaches down into my heart. Twisting and tearing it. Hmm. Oh, terrible. Oh, terrible. Don't be alarmed. It's nothing. Just one of those attacks. They go as quickly as they come. It's almost gone now. Gerald, you must let me send for a doctor. No. No, they're all, they're all cracks. I've tried specialists all over the world. They, they've never done, never done a thing for me. Darling, if you love me, you'll let me send for one. Oh. I love you. You don't know what you mean to me. My happiness, my life. I need you, Carol. Never leave me, darling. Never. No, I won't. I won't. I'm so thrilled to see you. I began to think I had smallpox or something. Not being invited here till the 11th hour. Well, didn't Aunt Lou explain? Yeah, she told me Gerald had been ill, but... You know how straight she gets anything. Like a corkscrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gerald is ill. As a matter of fact, the doctor's upstairs with him now. Oh, but Aunt Lou said he wouldn't even see a doctor. I made him. Ah. It's only the village doctor, but he has a fine reputation. And I just had to know that Gerald is well enough to travel tomorrow. Well, where are you off to? Only Gerald knows. Oh, come along and I'm dying to talk to you. Oh, Carol. Listen. Ronnie's outside. What? He, he drove me down. He wants to say goodbye to you. God, see him. Suppose Gerald... Oh, I'll deal with the old dragon. I'm not afraid of him. Oh, that's silly of me. Of course Gerald would understand. And he isn't an old dragon. <laughs> <laughs> you go along out and bring Ronnie in. and I'll get Emmy started with the tea. Oh, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Whatever in the world are you doing up there? Didn't you hear the front door bell ring? Oh, I didn't hear, ma'am. You thought it was all on the fair tonight. I heard the gypsies out on the road. Well, you'll have plenty of time for that later, Emmy. I want you to get tea for three, please. Oh, but Master said I could go home early now. Now? He gave me ten shillings. The Master gave me? Yes, about my wages. Ten shillings to go to the fair tonight. And he said not to bother to come back in the morning because you won't be needing me. Well, it's the first I've heard of all this, Emma. Oh. Oh, well, please, ma'am, shan't I come? Oh, I got everything ready for your dinner. Oh, of course it's all right. Just put on the kettle and then you can go. Oh, thank you, ma'am. And you will take good care of things while we're away, won't you? Oh, that I will. And you let me know when you'll be coming back. Yes, we'll give you a good warning about that. Goodbye. Goodbye, ma'am. Hello, Ronnie. Oh. <laughs> well? Well? Well, well. Now, let's get all these formalities over so we can all be ourselves. Well, first of all, Ronnie wants to know if you've forgiven him for the way he acted that night in Paris. Oh, of course I have. Oh, well, now we're getting on. Oh, the next thing. He wants to tell you that they didn't find out anything at Scotland Yard, so he told them to drop the investigation. Now, I wonder if there's anything else. Oh, Kate, I can do my own explaining. I know you can, but you take so long. We've got such a lot to talk about, haven't we, Carol? Well, I should like to apologize to Gerald, Mayor. 
There's no need to apologize. He understands. Besides, he'll be down in just a minute as soon as the doctor leaves. I do want you to be friends. Goody, goody. Now, all that's settled, so let's sit down and relax. <laughs> it's a pack of lies. I'm afraid it isn't. I found a definite myocardial condition. Ha! You're a quack! Like all the others. A pulse doesn't lie. Yours is 120. I wouldn't advise you to get too excited about anything. To overexert yourself in any way. It's no use prescribing. I don't believe in that sort of thing. I'll leave them here. They might relieve the pressure in your head. I tell you, nothing can relieve it. Nothing. I... Interested in criminology? Hmm? Oh, yes, I am. Oh. You'll find some remarkable cases in that book. I've made quite a study of crime myself. Happened to have this book in my own library, just published. Picked it up only the other day. Really, did you? What do you think of the Fletcher case? Extraordinary, wasn't it? Three women. Must have been pretty relentless. Or mad. He could have been mad, you know. Oh, undoubtedly, he was mad. Then how do you account for his brilliance? Escaping the law. Turning up here, there, everywhere. Hello, where's Fletcher's photograph? Photograph? I don't think I've ever seen a photograph of him. I'm positive there was one in the book. No, no, nothing here. There's one in my book at home. I'll bring it round someday. Oh, I was forgetting. You're leaving in the morning. No, oh, well, I can see it when I get back. I've always been rather interested in Fletcher. What type of man is he? His appearance? Fairish, sandy type. Beard and moustache. If that heart of yours cuts out again, Lovell, take some of those pills. They won't kill you. I don't want to worry you, Mrs. Lovell, but I wish you'd keep in touch with me. And if your husband should get any worse, call me in. Any time, night or day, and we'll get a specialist. Oh, thank you, Dr. Griffith. I suppose we'd better be hopping off. Oh, no, you mustn't leave. We're having tea, and then you've got to stay for dinner. Has to be potluck. My cook's off tonight. Oh, we'll have fun, Kate, rustling around the kitchen. The way we used to in the old days. But how about, um... Oh, oh, yes. Well, I'll... Wait a minute. I'll just dash up and see you. All right. Feel better about things now? Yes and no. Mind you, my feelings about Carol will never change. I'm crazy about her. And always will be. Does she seem really happy to you? There are one or two things that strike me as being distinctly odd. In what way? They're going away like this. So secretly, nobody knowing where. Oh, that's too much. Take the bed and up and on that man. No, I won't have it. Send them away. Send them away at once. Well, well. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he wanted us to leave. I'm so sorry. You'll have to excuse Gerald. He's, he's feeling a little off color tonight, a bit nervy and all that. Oh, we understand. After all, it is a bit awkward, isn't it? We better be going. Oh, I can't bear to have you leave. It's been heaven seen.
You'll write to us, won't you? Of course I shall. When are you coming back? Oh, next spring or early summer, I expect. Carol, are you sure you're all right? Of course I am, Ronnie. Goodbye. Take care of yourself. Bless you. leaving anyone so much in all my life. Gives me a funny kind of feeling, too. I have a good mind to go back and... No. You'll only make it more embarrassing for Carol. Come on. They've gone. Good. I'm sorry to shoot them off like that, dear. But it's good to be alone with you again. Feeling better? Much. Well, the old pill slinger didn't alarm you, did he? Not at all. Good. <laughs> Whatever there's a fee in sight, the medicos can always find something wrong with one. No, I wouldn't say that about Dr. Gribble. He seemed to me a very sincere and intelligent person. Gerald, did you tell Emma she could go off to the fair tonight? Yes. Had you forgotten that we were going ourselves at nine o'clock? Don't you remember you put it in your little book? What an excellent memory you have. But as we're leaving so early in the morning, I think we'd better go to the fair right here. You can help me clean up my dark room at nine o'clock. nearby, so I thought I'd run in and have a chat with Mr. Lovell. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, Mr. Lovell's just gone down to the village. Oh, then he must be feeling better. When do you expect him back? Well, I promised to have dinner ready for him at 8 o'clock. He'll, he'll probably be along oh. then. What time do you leave in the morning? At the crack of dawn. Oh, then I'm afraid I shan't see him. I'll leave him this book. Uh, oh, he has that one. Oh, it's a different edition, I think. He asked me about a photograph of uh, Fletcher, a man who's mentioned in the book. I wish he wouldn't read that stuff. That's the one. Who is he? A murderer. He killed three women. Doesn't seem possible, does it? He looks more like a doctor, a scientist. Not a doctor, I hope. <laughs> Strange. I must have seen pictures of him somewhere before. In newspapers, I expect. Mm -hmm. Won't you sit down and wait for Mr. Lovell? No, thanks. I must get along. Well, you'll probably pass him on the road. I hope so. Don't you bother to come to the door. Good night. Good night. And thank you. Good night. that photograph get back into my book. I thought you'd gone down to the village. That photograph. I burned it at the bottom of the garden. The ashes flew away. I saw them. How can it have got back? Tell me. Don't look at me like that, Gerald. It's perfectly simple. Dr. Gribble was just... Ah. So that's it, is it? A conspiracy, you and Gribble. So he's in it, too. What are you trying to find out? Why are you asking me all these questions? Tell me. I haven't asked you any questions. Give me that book. Give me that book. 
What's the matter with you? What are you staring at? You startled me. What do you mean I startled you? Why are you startled? Perfectly natural, isn't it? You fly into a violent rage over a book that Dr. Gribble has just brought five minutes ago. I thought you'd gone to the village. I told him... Oh, so this is old Gribble's book, is it? Of course it is. Then why didn't you say so before? You really didn't give me a chance. You flared up at me. So I thought you were going to be ill. That's why I was so frightened. Oh... Yes, I see. I'm sorry, it was silly of me. No. Silly of me to be such a baby. Well, don't blame me. I'll be all right tomorrow. You shouldn't look at these books. They always disturb you. Especially the illustrations. That's why I destroyed the photograph in my copy. Well, we'll get rid of this one now, shall we? And this time, we'll make sure of it. Where are you off to? Just going into the garden. Why? Um, to get some flowers for the table. Oh, no, my precious. I wouldn't think of letting you wander in the garden alone. There are a lot of undesirable people about. You know what it is, the fairs, gypsies and so on. Heaven knows when we'd be prowling around. We'd better be on the safe side. Yes, you're quite right. I'll just get on with the dinner. Wait a minute, I want to help you. What's the matter? Nothing, I just... Well, of course, you need some food. It would never do to have you feeling faint, would it, sweetheart? I feel quite all right. I look all right, don't I? Beautiful. My lovely, dutiful wife who does everything I ask. Prepares my dinner with her own hands. Where's the dress that I asked her to wear? Love, honor, and obey. That's it, isn't it, Carol? Yes. Yeah. Come on, let's get the dinner. Excellent supper. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Have some more brandy. No, thank you. I still have some here. Ha-ha! <laughs> you know, I believe you're trying to make me drunk. You couldn't do that. I've got a very strong head. And it's always a pity to drink too much at moments like these. It deadens the appreciate... Funny sound. Hear that? It deadens the appreciation. Quarter to nine. Well, that reminds me. You remember we lost the key to the clock? Well, I found it in the pocket of one of my suits. I... Time I wound the old thing up. It seems hardly worthwhile if we're leaving tomorrow. It all 
always gives me a strange sort of thrill to see the minutes slipping by, one by one. I can remember so well standing in my headmaster's study at school, waiting for the beating, watching the hand for the clock to move on, and knowing there was nothing I could do to stop them. I can remember the strange mixture of sensations it used to give me. Terror. And yet with it a strange sort of delight. You can't find the key to the door, dear. I have it. I'm touching your coffee. What? Here's your coffee. Oh, yes. How far away your voice sounds. Must be my head. Don't you think you'd better lie down? No, we must be getting to work soon. Don't you think it would be better if you didn't do any more this evening? No, I've made my plans and I never alter my plans. Oh, all right. You're a sensible girl, aren't you? How do you mean? Well, you don't go on as a man. But if you women can say, oh, all right. And leave it at that. And then most women are fools. Do you think so? I don't think. I know. Born fools. And woman's weakness is man's opportunity. Did someone write that? Or did I think of it myself? If I did, it's good. It's very good. <laughs> woman's weakness is man's opportunity. You have exceptional insight into things. Some more coffee? Yes, yes, I have great insight. But, well, you see, I'm... Uh, I'm different from other people. Yes, I think you are. For instance, I've a lot of power over women. I've always had it. I discovered quite early in life that I could twist women around my little finger. It's a useful gift. It must be. If you could be slightly different from their own men, folk. In what way? Well, few men have sense enough to, to do the little romantic things that please their women. And all the world over, there are women longing for romance. They're not content with their lives. They want to color them, to be adventurous. Yes, I see. When the house agent told me that you were letting your flat because you'd won the lottery. I knew that you would be looking for some escape. Some romantic escape. I don't know why I'm telling you all this, I'm sure. Oh, because you know how, how much it interests me. No woman ever tires of hearing how a man came to fall in love with her. <laughs> no, of course she doesn't, does she, my treasure? And ours was a real romance, wasn't it? <laughs> Just what you were looking for. <laughs> stuffy in here. <laughs> Where are you going? There's no air in here. You have all the doors and windows shut. What's the matter? You're shivering. No. Yes, you are. You don't need that night air. What you need is a cup of coffee. No, thanks. Oh, yes, you do. Where's your scarf? It's time to put it on. Time? Time. Because you're cold. Come and sit down. I'll get it for you. I don't need it, really. Sure. Strange coincidence, Dr. Gribble and I both being interested in Fletcher. Yes, isn't it? He thinks that most murderers are mad, that they've got a kink somewhere. That's nonsense, of course. A murderer is often a bit saner than other people. Don't you agree? You know that I don't study these things. I don't know anything about it. No. Pity. Now, Fletcher here. 
Fletcher's well worth studying. He never makes a mistake. He must be very clever. He's a genius. Gerald, if you don't mind, I think I'll go to bed. I'm really terribly tough. Have you forgotten? You were going to help me. Yes, if you just relax a moment. You seem to be under such tension. Very well, then I will. If you read to me. Read what? From this book. Not about... Yes, yes. I want to hear... I want to hear someone reading it. Reading it out loud. Thousands and thousands of people must have read it. Maybe reading it now. But one can't see or hear them. That's right, that's right. Begin at the... Begin at the introduction. All the best part of it's there. Oh, go on, go on. George Edward Fletcher, to give him the name by which he was tried, for his real name is still unknown, was acquitted on an attempted murder charge owing to insufficient evidence and the brilliance of his defense, although he was suspected of having done away with no less than three young women. Three? After his acquittal, Fletcher disappeared. And three months later, overwhelming evidence against him came to light. Speak louder, dear. Possessed of an extraordinary fascination, he would make the acquaintance of a girl, persuade her to marry him after only a few weeks or even days, and then induce her to sign papers, making over to him any sum of money she might possess. I still can't hear you. It was his habit to rent a small place in an out-of-the-way neighborhood. After living there for two or three months, he would announce to neighbors or acquaintances that he and his wife were going abroad for some time. Now, go on, louder, louder, louder. The fact that the Mrs. Fletcher of the moment was never actually seen to leave the place seems to have awakened no suspicion. Yet in every case, the seller could have told a guilty secret. Gerald! What? Now, go on, go on, go on. What if one of these women had found out beforehand and made an appeal to him? Why do you ask? Well, it's interesting to know how the mind of that kind of man works. Do you think if he was fond of the woman, and I suppose he was fond of some of them? Oh, yes, a bit, certainly. Then don't you think he would have listened to an appeal? The situation never arose, I should imagine. But no, 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 I'm quite sure he would never have let anything influence him. But suppose she said to him, look here, I know who you are and what you're after. I'm entirely at your mercy. You can take the money, all of it. Ah, but he got that money already. Yes, I know, but suppose she said to him, I don't care about that. If only you let me go, I promise I'll never prosecute you. I'll never inform the police. What do you think he might have said? Can you imagine a man risking his life on a woman's silence? And yet you think he'd welcome any chance of escaping from the horror of the actual... Then perhaps it didn't seem... Perhaps there was no horror in it for him. No, no, you see, there are other sides to it. Power, the combination of the race, the climax of the music. At one moment to hold someone in your arms, and at the next to hold something. And if you scream, no one will hear you. Gerald, no, wait, wait, there's something I've got to tell you. I don't want to hear it. You will, you must, it concerns you. What do you mean? It would be a queer thing, wouldn't it, if a murderer were to marry a murderess? Queer, well, yes. But perfectly true. It's about a woman who killed a man and was never found out. What? Sit down. Hmm? Well, what are you waiting for? I want to get the whole thing perfectly clear in my mind. The whole truth. You see, it's my own story, Gerald. Your story? I killed a man. And I was never found out. You have? No one knew about it except my mother. When was this? When I was 18. I was a secretary. He had money. I was terribly tired of being poor. And this seemed a way out. 
I loathed him. He was mean. He was years older than I was. But I'm married. Well? It was really he who first put the idea into my head. He used to say to me, if we're careful with our money now, it'll be all the more for me to leave you. Where did all this happen? On the East Coast. Horrible little place. The wind never stopped blowing. Mm, go on, go on. I turned plan after plan over in my mind. And then finally, my opportunity came. What was it? Poison? Women usually use poison. No. It was much safer than that. That winter, he had pneumonia. I pretended to be heartbroken. It deceived everyone. I insisted on taking care of it myself. Ah, yes, yes. That was clever of you. And one night when I was alone with him, I realized the crisis had passed. That he was going to get better. I walked over to the window. I can see myself now, standing there. The frost has made such pretty patterns on the window pane. I stood there, trying to make up my mind. You opened the window. The air was like the night. I stripped down the bedclothes, and then I went outside to wait on the landing. Mm. When I came back into the room, he was dead. Mm. I closed the window. I made up the fire. I even put fresh hot water bottles in the bed. That's good, good, good. And then I sent for the doctor. No one suspected? No one, not a thing. Mm. And the money? I... I was very foolish about the money. It didn't last very long. Oh, yes, I understand so well. I always do exactly the same thing myself. Only there's just one thing that I don't understand. Oh? Why have you been telling me all this now? Don't you see? You know all about me now. I wouldn't dare give you away. I thought perhaps you and I could be of use to one another in the future. <laughs> yes, yes, that's a very good idea. If only there were a grain of truth in your story. Very clever of you, Carol. Arousing my interest and trying to put me off, but I happen to know that story. I've read the book myself. I remembered it the moment you told me that bit about the frost on the window panes. I remember that bit about the hot water bottle struck me as being such a good idea when I read it. You! <laughs> you! Opening the window and waiting for him to die! You don't think I believe that story, do you? No! Not for one moment did I expect you to believe it. I didn't care whether you believed it or not. What? You've forgotten one thing, you wonderful genius. I didn't drink any coffee. Coffee? Coffee? What's that got to do with it? I only wanted to hold your interest for a little while, to gain time. Time for the stuff to work. Stuff? What stuff? You're right. It was a funny coincidence that Dr. Gribble should bring me that book tonight. Gribble, he gave you... Yes! Yes, women always use poison, don't they? Now, you mean to choke the poison. You're deathly pale. It's beginning to paralyze you. You can't move, can you? You can't move. He's dead. I'm positive this is better. It's strange that we both had the same misgivings about him. I made him think I'd find him. Very good. Oh, my God. 